Well, I certainly appreciate the, the kind introduction. It seemed perhaps overly kind to me, but I certainly have no doubt that every word of it was heartfelt coming from Brother Dub. It's certainly a joy to be with him, to be with Brother and Sister Summers as well, and to be with each one of you, the brethren here at Spring, as we consider the valuable question, what must a Christian do to remain faithful to Christ? Uh, this is a question that every Christian should ask himself repeatedly. It's a question that every Christian needs to hear the answer and needs to be reminded of the answers repeatedly. You see, if at the end of our course we'll have been found unfaithful, all will have been for naught. Everything that we will have done will have been meaningless. Our lives will have been useless. And as such, the good elders here at the Spring Church of Christ uh, and the members and the good evangelists here are all to be commended for having a lectureship on this theme, what must a Christian do to remain faithful to Christ? One of the answers to the question, what must a Christian do to remain faithful to Christ, and the subject on which I will be speaking this morning is be ready to forgive a brother or sister who repents of sin. No one will attain faithfulness to the Lord without forgiveness. Uh, to forgive someone is, according to Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich's lexicon, the word that is translated forgive, is to release him from legal or moral obligation or consequence. We read in 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. As all sin, then, all are dependent on forgiveness, if they are to stand faithful. But not only is the Lord's forgiveness important, but also the forgiveness of brothers and sisters in Christ toward each other play a necessary role in attaining faithfulness. Jesus said, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Matthew 18 and verse 15. So then let us take a little closer look this morning at the importance of being ready to forgive a brother or sister who repents of sin. Let's begin by considering the mutual goal and benefit of the church. Now, the church is the body of the saved, and I'm not going to go into depth and discuss that. If you were here yesterday evening, you heard the, the sermon that Brother McClish brought with regard to the Lord's church and the value of it and the essential nature of it. And if you didn't, then you need to listen to it. And so listen to it again if you don't understand that the church is the body of the saved. Read the book of Ephesians. But as we say that, the church is far more than a mere holding tank or waiting room of the saved. We're just here for a little while, and this just holds us in a certain place until we're there. The church provides means of securing the salvation of her members. We read in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so the worship that we have as we all assemble together for worship is a time when we provoke one another to love and to good works. It's written in Colossians 3.16, when we're singing, we're teaching and admonishing one another, helping to secure each other's faithfulness. Also, we read, for example, in Acts chapter 8, when Simon, who had been a sorcerer, came to obey the gospel, he then fell into sin. When he was confronted with his sin, he said, Pray for me, that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. Acts 8 and 28. And so the prayer that members make in behalf of each other, that also helps to secure each other's salvation. We read in Revelation, the very first uh, chapter and verse 3. It says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, 
And so it's a blessing pronounced upon those who are partaking of that occasion where somebody is reading the Scripture, where others are hearing. Again, as it says in Hebrews 10.24, that we're to provoke one another to love and to good works, the joint participation that takes place in the work of the church, uh, that helps each other. In Acts 11, verses 29 and 30, we're told when Agabus and other brethren came to the church at Antioch, we're told, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And so they together encouraged one another. They were provoking one another to love and to good works. And as we read in Acts 20 verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so they were helping each other then attain that blessing found in giving and partaking of this work. In Hebrews 3.13 we're told, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so, the personal interaction and admonition that takes place between brethren, that also helps to secure one another's salvation. Galatians 6 1 would speak about a man being overtaken in a trespass. In such a case, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. James 5 19 and 20 speaks about a brother who might err from the truth. Reclaim him. Save his soul from death. Cover his multitude of sins. But these passages we have considered not only show that the church provides means of securing salvation, they also show that those who are part of the blood-bought church of Christ share a mutual goal and benefit. Of course, Christians share the goals of obeying the Father. They share the goals of bringing glory to His name. They share the goals of preaching the gospel to every creature. But additionally, Christians share the goal that every member persevere to the end of receiving the final reward of the righteous. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23, Paul spoke about his desire for that commendable church at Thessalonica. He said, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blindless on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was his desire. I want you to be found perfect, yet sanctified, in that day when Jesus Christ comes. Is that not all our desire? Again, Jesus said, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between them and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. What's the goal then? What is the goal of doing this? The ultimate goal is to gain the offending brother or sister. That's not only to gain that offending brother or sister oneself, to restore the friendship, the fellowship between one another that they had, but to restore that person particularly to the fellowship service, and glory of God. Immediately preceding Christ's instructions for dealing with an offending brother, Christ spoke about His and His Father's desire for a child of God who has fallen into sin. In Matthew 18 and verses 11 and following, Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How think you? If a man have an hundred sheep, doth he not... Leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray. And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Then he goes on and says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go. You go to Him, you try to reclaim Him, you try to gain Him for the Lord. And so just as it is the, the desire of Jesus and the Father that not one of these be lost, an offended Christian wants to see that brother or sister who has sinned against Him once more on the path to heaven. However, ignoring sin and pretending as if sin had never happened helps no one to arrive at heaven. 
Ignoring sin is as unloving a thing as a child of God might do. In Leviticus 19 verses 17 and 18, as we find in the Mosaic Law, but yet we find precepts that are viable to consider when we consider what the New Testament teaches, it says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt anywise rebuke thy brother and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. And so part of loving one's neighbor says you, you go to him, you rebuke him, and you do not allow sin to be upon him. And so that rebuking, that confronting, that is part of not allowing sin upon him, and that is part of truly loving one's neighbor. Love demands rebuking sin so that others might be forgiven of sin. That's what we're told when it says, go and tell him his fault, or as it might be translated, go and convince him of his fault, go and show him his fault. Jesus gave similar instructions on another occasion in Luke 17, 3 to his disciples. He said, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. We be brethren. This is the simple but powerful truth that Abraham pointed out when strife arose between his herdsmen and his nephew Lot's herdsmen, as recorded in Genesis 13.8. We be brethren. And so why should there be this continued strife? Why should there be this continued enmity? Now we know that although we might be brethren, sometimes there will be strifes that arise, there will be troubles that arise, and that is really part of being family, is it not? Now sometimes it's a little more serious than others. For example, with Joseph. Yeah, he had some squabbles with his brethren, uh, and they got a little heated, and he ended up being sold into slavery. Now, I got into a lot of squabbles with my brother and sister, but none of us ever actually sold each other to slavery. But that's what happened to him. He found himself in slavery, ended up in prison, but things all ended up working out. <clears throat> but his brothers had pretty much figured he'd be dead within a short time, and he had the certainly the ability and the right, probably, legally speaking, to put his brothers to death. But we read in Genesis 15, verse 15, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. They're thinking, well, Joseph's allowed us to live to this point, but only because he didn't want to grieve his father. He didn't want to grieve Jacob, knowing what it would bring upon him if he would have put us all to death. But now he's going to. But we'll read what Joseph said in Genesis 50, verse 19, the beginning. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Could have killed them. What did he do? He comforted them and spake kindly unto them. That's the kind of forgiveness that brothers and sisters should have for one another. This is the kind of forgiveness for which Christians have been admired. The well-renowned atheist, Marganita Lasky, said, What I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. In Colossians 2, 12 and 13, we're told, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. Speaking about uh, an attitude, uh, feelings of mercy, a desire to extend mercy. But put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Brethren, we are to be there for each other. We are to care for one another. And we are to help each other to reach heaven. If we are not going to help each other reach the heavenly goal, who outside the Lord is going to help us to do that? Who is going to? 
all who are in the church are brothers and sisters in the family of God and all seek and help each other attain one another's salvation. As brothers and sisters in Christ sing together each Lord's Day when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Don't we all want to be there? And don't we want to see that brother or sister who sits next to us in the pew, don't we want to see him or her there? And the forgiveness that brothers and sisters in Christ extend to each other plays a major part in reaching that goal. As such, Christians must stand ready to forgive. Well, that said, we've talked about then the mutual goal and benefit of the church. But let's talk about the necessary precondition. Jesus commands the offended brother to rebuke the offending brother. Go and tell him his fault. But something else must happen before he can forgive the offending brother. Jesus said, if, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. And so before that brother can be gained, he first must hear. Now that means more than simply sound waves falling upon his eardrums and uh, re, uh, registering in his brain as sound. That means that the offending brother will pay close attention to those words, recognize his folly, and purpose in his mind to change his ways. In other words, that offending brother will repent. Again, Jesus said, If thy brother repent, forgive him, Luke 17, 3. Where there has been actual sin, there must be repentance. The concept of forgiveness without repentance is unbiblical and it is ungodly. It is commonly said to err is human to forgive divine. However, even God cannot forgive where there has been no repentance. The Lord fervently longs for man's salvation. We can go through numerous passages which speak about that being His great desire including those of the most vile sin who, who, that they have committed. He longs for their salvation. And God longs for that salvation. He forbears judgment that men and women might be saved. We're told in 2 Peter 3.15, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. That doesn't mean that salvation is assured because the Lord has not brought judgment yet. That merely means the opportunity for salvation still remains because of that. As it's elsewhere expressed, the same thought in verse 9 of 2 Peter 3, is that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. To avoid that perishing, to avoid dying in one sin, there must be that repentance. Again, He does not desire that any perish, but sinners who refuse to repent will certainly perish. Luke 13, 3 and 5. And so if God, the omnipotent one, the one of the many omnis, as Brother Hightower noted a moment ago, if He cannot forgive the sin of a person who has yet to repent, why would human beings presume to have the right and ability to forgive an unrepentant sinner? The... Brethren at Corinth did a marvelous job of, quote, forgiving the unrepentant fornicator in their midst. We read in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 and 2, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. You're acting as if he's cleared of this sin. No repentance had taken place on the part of this fornicator whatsoever. Yet the brethren at Corinth treated him as though he were faithful and clear of sin. Again, to err is human, to forgive divine. But not only is forgiveness a divine attribute, forgiveness is a divine prerogative. 
God had not forgiven this man, so neither could they. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5 and verse 11. They needed to repent of their wrongful forgiveness, if you want to call it that, uh, themselves, if they were to be faithful before God, a repentance which they thankfully made. As we read in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, and really all, almost all of that chapter speaks about how they responded to Paul's uh, urging, uh, how they responded to his admonitions, to his rebuke of them for failing to withdraw themselves from this man. But we're told that they did, and they attained a great clearing of themselves, 2 Corinthians 7, 11. In all things, you have approved, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. The Corinthians had withdrawn from that man as they had been divinely instructed in 1 Corinthians 5. And Christians are yet under divine obligation to withdraw from unrepentant brethren. Again, as Jesus spoke about going to that offending brethren, Matthew 18, 15, it goes on and speaks about what is to be done if he will not hear thee. That is, if he will not respond and repent. You go and take with him one or two more if he will not hear them. You're going to have witnesses. You're going to tell it to the church. And finally, you let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Second Thessalonians 3, 6 tells us to withdraw ourselves from someone who does not walk after the traditions which are received in Scripture. Many brethren balk at the notion that forgiveness demands repentance. Part of this is because they simply don't like what it has to say. It's maybe hard to do. A contributing factor to their confusion may also be, however, the fact that there is a general misuse of the term forgiveness. If you open up an English dictionary and look up the word forgiveness, it's not going to say what the Bible teaches about forgiveness. Uh, the primary definition, for example, in the New Oxford American Dictionary of forgive is to Stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense, flaw, or mistake. That's a, a big difference. The New Testament word for forgive, uh, the afiemi, when we find it referring to this, that usage is defined by Lowenita as to remove the guilt resulting from wrongdoing. Now, isn't that a big difference? Removing the actual guilt versus just having not feelings of resentment? Who can remove the guilt of sin? Only God can remove the guilt of sin. And even He could not do that without the perfect atonement, the blood shed of Jesus Christ upon Calvary's cross. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Numerous other verses speak about the fact that it was essential that the blood of Christ be shed. God just couldn't determine that in His mind. Again, being the omnipotent one, yet things have to be done. There had to be the blood of Christ and there has to be repentance. Now through that perfect atonement, God is able and eager to forgive those who repent. When one human being forgives another, it is a recognition of forgiveness that God has granted. And thus, when it is granted, it is a recognition and a submission to the divine will. But to pretend to grant forgiveness where God has not granted it is the opposite. It is rebellion against the most High God. And so there is this necessary precondition. And that's why this, this lecture this morning is entitled, Be ready to forgive any brother or sister who repents of sin. This must be met. This is a necessary requisite. But let's then consider the consequences of refusing forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness is not always easy. Uh, forgiveness often requires us to swallow our pride. Uh, forgiveness requires reconciliation when enmity would be easier. It might be easier in some situations to say, you know what, I'm just going to ignore that person for the rest of my life and never pay any attention to him again. 
What is the mother of a murdered child to do when that brutal murderer begs her forgiveness? Many mothers would refuse their forgiveness and most people would grant her the right to refuse in that kind of situation. That's an unforgivable type sin. And what you've had done to you, you don't have to forgive. But God does not grant her that right. Notice what Christ went on to say after He instructed His disciples to rebuke and forgive one's brother. In Luke 17, 3, He went on to say in verse 4, He said, And if thy brother trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive. We see then that there is indeed a high bar of forgiveness. It would be very difficult for me to forgive anybody who continued to sin against me. Somebody came back, came up to me and, you know, kind of smacked me in the face. He said, oh, sorry, I, I repent. I, I won't do that again. All, all right. <laughs> Okay, don't let it happen again. Oh, I won't. An hour later, it comes back and smacks me in the face to get even harder. I repent. <laughs> Boy, it's getting a little harder and we're up to seven times and I'm supposed to forgive? Well, the Bible says yes. And really, when we read about seven times, that does not limit the times within a day that one is to forgive an individual. Seven times may be a model, but seven times is not a maximum. We read in... Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. Then came Peter to Jesus and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him until seven times? And he meant seven times total. Jesus responded, I said unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Again, a month, 490 times, he said, but a month, not a maximum. If that person repents, you continue to forgive. So we're called then to do something that's hard, but it's yet a commandment of the Lord. And Jesus said, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. And so if we are to obey, this is something that we are going to do and to fail to do so as to fail to obey. And what ultimately happens? A lot of times we might withhold forgiveness to try and get back at somebody. You can see that they feel guilty and you say, you know what, I'm going to let them, them stew in that guilt a little while. I'm going to make it hurt them as bad as they hurt me. But you know what, withholding forgiveness might hurt that offender, but it hurts the one withholding forgiveness every bit as much and oftentimes more. In James 3.14 we're told, But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. That chapter speaks about those who would be striving for positions, these elevated positions of teaching. It speaks about those who would be using their tongue to curse others. And all those are ways in which people have bitter envying and strife in their hearts. And withholding forgiveness is another way that people keep bitter envying and strife in their hearts. In speaking of those who had been his enemies during the Civil War, Lincoln is reported to have said, and based on all the other things that he did and said, I don't doubt that it's true, but he's reported to have said, is it insane as it may seem, I have malice toward none of them. I have neither the time nor the energy in this life to hold that kind of resentment. Christians ought to be such shining examples of forgiveness. And sometimes they are. As we know, there are people who say, I want the kind of forgiveness that Christians have. But it's not always that way. In some cases, the influence of churches have been completely destroyed in their community because they've seen the bitter infighting, the bickering that has gone on in churches where brethren either refuse to repent or... Refuse to forgive. Romans 2.24 For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. And sometimes the name of God is blasphemed among the infidels because we refuse to forgive. Christians can and must be better 
than that. We read in Proverbs 19.11, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and is his glory to pass over a transgression. That thinking is foreign to a lot of ways of thought, especially when you consider that that was written to an Eastern culture. In such cultures, typically, any kind of insult, how is that to be responded to? Well, by challenging that person to some type of show of arms or some type of physical demonstration, you're going to defend your honor. But here we're told, <clears throat> it is His glory to pass over a transgression. That's His glory. That's what Christians are to do. But sometimes we refuse and we fail to bring the glory to the name of the Lord that we should. Refusal to forgive can cause a soul to be lost. We're told in 2 Corinthians <clears throat> that after the Corinthians have withdrawn from the fornicating brother, that <clears throat> indeed the man was ready to be forgiven, the man had repented. We read then in 2 Corinthians 2 verses 6 and following, sufficient to such a man as this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, <clears throat> lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. There is a danger that this man might be swallowed up with his sorrow about his sin, and you're not forgiving him, you're not comforting him. And it goes on to says in verse 11, lest Satan should give an, get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And one of the devices that Satan can use is failure, to, failure to, to forgive. This man certainly could have fallen into sin because of the refusal of brethren to forgive. In Luke 17, as Jesus Christ has said, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. The previous verses, it said, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It says, goes on and says, if. You cause one of these little ones to repent. He says, it's better that a millstone were hanged about your neck and that you were cast into the sea. That is, that you're drowned in the sea than that you cause somebody else to stumble. And refusing to forgive somebody, refusing to allow him to see the forgiveness of God, then you stand likewise guilty of sin. Refusal to forgive violates the golden rule, as we often call it. Uh, Matthew 7, 12, we're told that we are to do unto men as we would have them to do unto us. Every Christian needs and depends on forgiveness. And if we try to claim that we don't, we, we're liars, 1 John 1, 8 and 10. And so others need forgiveness as well, and we should be willing to show them that. And as we read in Matthew 6, in verse 12, as Jesus gave His disciples the model prayer, a prayer which in all its elements pertained to prior to the cross and prior to the establishment of the church, yet we do find being said there, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's a principle of prayer which carries over to the new as well. This carries over to the Christian age. Each Christian owes an unrepayable debt to God for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus pictured this unrepayable debt as a debt of 10,000 talents owed by a slave. 10,000 talents might not mean a whole lot to us, but it's a debt that would require a standard day laborer 60 million days of work to repay. 60 million days. Not just hours, days of work to repay. Unrepayable. And he went on and gave that parable in Matthew 18, 23 and following when he spoke about the man who then was forgiven of that great debt because he fell and said, please forgive me. His Lord had compassion on him, loosed him, forgave him that debt. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. That's a pretty fair sum. That's about a hundred days worth of work. Again, a fair sum, but you consider a hundred days... Versus 60 million days. That's not 1%. That's not one-tenth of a percent. That's not one one-hundredth of a percent. And he went and I took him by the throat, shaking him, and said, you pay me what you owe me. And that servant fell down and said the same thing that he had said to his master. But yet he wouldn't forgive him. He threw him into prison until he should pay all that was due on him. And his Lord, his master, found out what he had done. 
He said, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you desired me. Shouldn't you have had that same compassion on your fellow servant even as I had on you? And he was wroth, we're told, and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all the debt that was due on him. And Jesus went on to say, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do unto you, if ye from your heart forgive not every one his brother their tres trespasses. When we refuse to forgive, we act just like this unforgiving servant. Any forgiveness we might grant is a mere pittance when compared to the forgiveness that God has granted. Yet our own forgiveness is dependent upon the forgiveness that we grant others. Forgive us our debts, we're told to pray, as we forgive our debtors. Jesus went on and explained in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. One who refuses forgiveness can only look forward to being delivered to torment. All Christians are working together toward a mutual goal. To bring as many people as possible to achieve faithfulness in the Lord and finally to land on that heavenly shore. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Forgiveness can only be granted where there is repentance, but it must be granted where there is repentance. And for a Christian to fail to do so represents a failure on his part of the Christian mission and ultimately will result in the loss of his soul. And so we conclude with what was said as we're told that what we are to be as Christians in Ephesians 4. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you.